Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim. Today, we're speaking about the importance of nutrition to the next generation's health with special guests, Anne-Marie Krautheim, the CEO of Gen Youth, Kathleen King, CEO of Healthier Kids Foundation, and Jennifer Owens, President and CEO of Health Empowers. Thank you all for joining us. This is just wonderful to have you all here. Thank you. It's our pleasure. Thank you. Well, it's I'm I'm really looking forward to this. So I'm going to set this up. I'm going to go to Anne Marie, and then we're going to go around uh, this virtual room and just talk a little bit about each of your approaches to ensuring that our children uh, are healthy. There was a 20 year study published by the American Medical Association's JAMA Network. You can look it up. In it was in 2021. Um, and it states about 67% of a U.S. youth's diet consists of ultra-processed foods. Ultra-processed, that's two-thirds of, of our diet. Unbelievable. And a separate study shows that the proportion of, of uh, kids living with obesity increases from 18% in uh, 2011 to 22% in 2020. So we're going in the wrong direction. That's one in five American children are living with obesity. My goodness. So Anne-Marie, uh, your work at uh, GenU focuses primarily on school, school communities. So uh, let's talk a little bit about, about your background, how you got into this, and also the approach that GenU takes to addressing these really important issues. Great. Thank you, Mark. Um, I'm actually a registered dietitian by training. So I, I wanted to spend my career really helping the public develop healthy eating habits. You know, nutrition uh, is one of the most controllable pieces of our, our livelihood that contributes to our health and well-being. Um, many of the chronic diseases that we're facing in this country are affected by nutrition and our dietary intake. And when I had the opportunity to join Gen Youth, which was formed about 10 years, well, 12 years ago, um, through a partnership between America's Dairy Farmers and the National Football League, um, it was just such a wonderful opportunity to help our organization develop public and private partnerships that would ultimately help to create healthier school communities. And our work primarily centers on two primary areas. One is through schools to help increase access to healthy foods. Our schools feed 30 million children uh, on average each day in this country. And one in eight children in America is living in food insecurity. For children in communities of color, it's closer to one in five. So schools are really a lifeline for those children in terms of providing healthy, nourishing meals. In fact, a study from Tufts recently showed that schools kids out of all the meals that kids are eating, the healthiest meals are at school. So our work is helping to increase access to those healthy meals. And then we also work to increase opportunities for physical activity before, during, and after the school day. They're inextricably linked to not only health and dietary intake, but also classroom performance, classroom behavior, school attendance, connectedness with their peers, which are critically important to children. So it's not only about the school is not only about about learning. It's about setting up healthier habits. It's also having the foundation, the nutritional foundation so that you can concentrate so that you can actually take in the lessons that are being uh, conveyed. Right. Exactly. Hungry children cannot learn. Uh, and I think we'd all agree that the only hunger that a child should experience is the hunger to learn. Kathleen, could you uh, give us your take on, on this? And then we're going to delve into some of the issues that are begged by, uh, by your statements, Anne-Marie, about how we can actually improve the situation. Because one in eight uh, American children living in food insecurity, if you're a person of color, 20% living of these, of these children. I mean, what a, a waste of, of a civic society's most precious gift, right? If, 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 we're, if we're putting our children through that, we should be able to change that. Kathleen, um, how do you take, uh, what's your uh, cut on this, on this issue uh, through the Healthier Kids Foundation? Well, first, thanks for having me. And I'd highly recommend everyone go on each other's websites because it's fascinating. Yeah, we, we could be complementing and partnering on much of what we do. Um, my background is high tech. I was fortunate enough to make a, a, a good amount of money before I became a nonprofit leader. 
And I have a son uh, that went through two bone marrow transplants when he was five and decided that I needed to give back. He survived and I needed to give back. So our 10 Steps to a Healthier You is focused on education of parents with children between, say, two and eight years old to help them understand that we have to get back to basics, like what our grandparents ate, that uh, juice is... um, is a demon that we should not be serving. Potter the otter drinks water is a lot of our effort. We're mostly in the underserved areas. And it's a 10 steps class, a couple of four of the steps are about food and what's good food for you. Um, Exercise, less screen time and sleep. We think sleep is critical to the health of children. And I would say the most efficient place for all of us to work is not in the pediatric office, but in the schools, because it's such an efficient way to get to many children at once. And I'll just say that our state, only by a couple hours, was the first state to have universal meal program mm-hmm. for all school children in 2022, 2023. This is the first year we've had it. And it's um, breakfast and lunch healthy breakfast and lunch. And um, the state will cover anything that the federal government doesn't cover. So we think that's a really nice step to getting everyone to have a balanced start to the day because we think health is wealth and we think health so ties to education and education so ties to health. Everything we can do when they're young is only going to pay back later. Thanks. Liza Rosier says she loves the Potter Otter. So uh, <laughs> so there you go. Uh, you know, one of the things that is so interesting is that we're all educated through advertising, right? And and that advertising is selling us highly processed food very often. I mean, you very rarely uh, have, have somebody says, um, you know, eat carrots, right? Instead, you have people saying, you know, eat whatever the highly processed food um, food that is coming out of the various manufacturers. So what you're talking about is re-educating parents so that they can educate their children. And of course, the schools are also uh, 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 trying to do that. Jennifer, what is the what is the uh, take of health and powers of this very complicated uh, question? How do you approach yeah. uh, question here? Thank you. Thank you. And good morning, everyone. Uh, Health Empowers is based in the state of Georgia. It's where we do all of our work. We reach about 75,000 children, mostly free and reduced lunch eligible or coming from families that are eligible for SNAP benefits across the state. And our take is very similar, but there's a thread that continues to come up, and that is how much we learned during COVID about how important the school is, not just to the learning environment, to our children, but for the community and all of the services that it provides. I know here in the state when COVID initially hit, you know, districts were just doing everything they could to get meal programs up and running, to get sack lunches on buses, to get deployed to neighborhoods. Uh, Parents were struggling to figure out what to do with children while they, you know, worked and schooled from home. And it is just a reminder of how important the school environment is to our community as well as to our children. Um, Our take is really a multi-year, multi-layer initiative, similar to the recent recommendations of the American Association of Pediatrics um, around how you need to be sort of consistent and ongoing with the education and the opportunities for kids to practice new behaviors, whether it's healthy eating, physical activity, or otherwise. And so we go in, we enter into multi-year partnerships with school districts. Uh, We have a very big emphasis on being youth-led and youth-centered as well as equity-driven and look for opportunities for students to experience nutrition education with their hands, with their tastes, with their smells, um, getting out in the garden, doing taste tests in the classroom, having reinforcement messaging in the school hallways and the cafeteria. Uh, And then we also look for ways to be innovative as well, to really embrace the ideas that the youth are bringing to the table. And I think the most important uh, philosophy that we have here at Health Empowers is that when you give students the opportunity to lead and exercise agency over their own health, 
health, they will go all the way. And so right now we're really excited. One of the things we have happening in some middle schools around the state are actually student run food pantries that use um, unused cafeteria food. Pantries are set up in the school environment. Students can come by on their way to the bus or on their way to walk home, take what they need for themselves or for their family. No questions asked uh, so that we're continuing that nutrition, nutritious food um, back into the homes as well. So um, here at Health Empowers, we're highly focused on the state of Georgia. We've got plenty of work to do here as obesity is the number one condition that affects Georgia children. The thing that really strikes me about talking with, with you three accomplished leaders, and I'm sure this is true for the people who support you, is how diverse your perspectives are, your geographies are, your, your own professional backgrounds are. In terms of, of solving this problem, in other words, um, not just constantly um, bailing water with a pitchfork, right? <laughs> where, the pro- where we do a lot of effort, but nothing actually progresses. How do we bring people together of different capabilities so that we systemically shift the narrative when it comes to uh, to children so that we don't have so many kids growing up in poverty, so we don't have so many kids growing up in food insecurity? I mean, we can't go and admonish a child like we can an adult, even if that works, to work harder, right? The kids are dependent on, on us as parents, but they're also dependent on society why should a child that is that happens to be born into a poor family um, uh, not be able to absorb knowledge because they're hungry all the time and Marie how do you how do you see this how can we actually shift this in this country so that we end up with with more children who are learning more who are more empowered who are healthier how do we do this? Yeah, I think it it really boils down to some of the points that have already been made by um, Jennifer and Kathleen and and myself. The school is really the great equalizer. It provides equitable access to education, to healthy meals, to safe places for kids to be physically active. However, um, our school resources are slim and tight. Um, and you're talking- your money for your for your everybody here. You're you're all raising your money as a separate endeavor, right? You're not right. by the school. Our now. work is by and large free to schools. The average PE teacher budget is a dollar fifty per student per year. Uh, school nutrition, just like we're all facing in our own households, food prices are up. Gas prices are up. There's labor shortages. The supply chain's broken. Um, And as I mentioned, 30 million students are relying on those school nutrition programs for a significant portion of their daily nutrition. Schools can't do it alone. Organizations like ours provide a vehicle where the public and the private sector can come together to help supply cash and resources and equipment to schools so they can better provide that equitable access to kids. It's vitally important. I, we actually have an advisory council made up of leading health and nutrition and academic um, organizations in the country. And I just want to share one quote quickly yesterday, because I thought it was so meaningful that schools are such a vital resource for our children. Uh, Mark, as you've said, but school meals get kids to school. And once they're in the school building, It allows them access to all those other benefits. So that's why so much of our work at Gen Youth is focused on increasing access to school breakfast and increasing participation, because it's not only going to help nourish those kids, it's going to get them in the building, and then they have access to those other resources. That's really interesting. So basically, by providing good nutrition, you're actually marketing education. That's really interesting. You know, I never I never really thought of that. Kathleen, does that make sense to you? Absolutely. I I agree. You can't have children at school that are hungry or suffering from a toothache. I mean, we, we, we don't spend enough on education, but what we spend, we have to know is really being used and we need to know kids are in the classroom. And so I I'm in agreement on the big picture. It's I double checked yesterday and our soda companies in California went in and said, if you try and do another soda tax locally, we will change your, we will put a referendum out that says all your tax initiatives or anything you do at the school level will require two thirds vote. So they forced the state legislators to agree 
did not have any local taxes on soda till 2035. I mean, I don't know how you fight these things except through education. I mean, well, it's, I mean it's, it's like exercise, right? Like Jennifer was talking about you exercise your ability to eat vegetables. You exercise drinking water with maybe a little watermelon in it instead of juice. It's it's that I don't know how you do it, except you do it through education. A third in The Economist last week, a third of the world is obese right now. That was the data. I it's think scary. you hit on something really important, though, Kathleen. And in, in some cases, I think, you know, poor personal choices is being used as a scapegoat, frankly, to not address yeah. structural, economic, and in some, you know, many cases, sort of race-based structural barriers to, to nutritious food. And I think uh, this is a, an all-in approach that's required. We do, uh, you know, nutrition education and physical activity promotion, uh, you know, day in, day out with parents, with educators, with students with community members. But at the same time, we have got to also, you know, be pushing on structural changes as well to make the healthier choice, the easier choice. Uh, it is not a, a one, one or the other. There's no silver bullet here. For us, this is an all-in approach that needs policy systems and environmental changes alongside the education that's happening. Yeah, because I, I was uh, told by some of my staff yesterday that, um, in Mexico, they do put up in the grocery stores how much extra fat, sugar, et cetera, are in the um, items you buy. And we can't seem to make that happen in the U.S. Or at least we can't make it happen in California that I've seen. So I, I'm totally in agreement that it's like smoking, right? Sooner it will become the biggest issue. You know, it doesn't it doesn't escape my notice here that uh, I'm I'm the only man on this uh, on this uh, uh, program, and we needed uh, some diversity. Yeah, well, <laughs> um, and, and that—that's the other thing that didn't escape my notice, right? We're all white. <laughs> um, my my question on this is: How do you shift things um, in in a way that engages the creativity of all sorts of different people, all sorts of different genders, identities, um, races, and so on and so forth? in a way that is empowered and good for our kids. You know, how, how, how do we get to that point where uh, communities from inside of themselves, communities of men, communities of women, communities of people who identify in other ways, uh, communities of color, um, uh, communities from, from different regions are looking at the same problem set and coming up with solutions that make civil society, that make our kids healthier. How do we how do we exchange information and how do you exchange information, Jennifer, as you're as you're trying to engage different segments of America in, in this struggle to to ensure that that all children actually have access? I think there's some real bright spots happening. And if I'm being completely transparent, my philosophy as a white leader of an organization that is equity driven, that serves a majority kids of color, is to get out of the way, trust that the experts live in the community or, and are the impacted individuals themselves and ask, what do you need? And help bring resources to the table or training opportunities or stand as an ally when needed. Um, we've got some really exciting projects, community-driven projects here in the state as well as in the city of Atlanta around urban agriculture, farm to school mm -hmm. movements, uh, food co-ops that are, you know, sort of centering uh, long legacy, you know, Black-led agriculture traditions here in the state. So I, I am... I, there are some good things happening, and I think part of our job is to just take a step back and listen and ask what is needed and how we can serve as an ally. Yeah. And Jennifer, to add to that, um, I know you're very youth driven and, and believe in youth leadership and Gen Youth shares that principle as well. Um, we have a youth advisory council that we count on to share with us their ideas. Again, it's diverse in gender and race um, from schools that are in high need communities. And youth have why they've wisely told us if it's about me, don't do it without me. Mm -hmm. And I think that's so critical that youth have a voice in this. We we are organizations that are led by adults, and and we all have great intentions and and well meaning. Um, but at the end of the day, if it's not going to work in helping to 
inspire or change the behaviors of youth, who's better to help inform that thinking but youth themselves? I agree. We have a youth advisory board and actually we have one of them that serves on our formal board of directors as well. And every time we convene them, you know, we I think we take great care to just sort of take a step back, sit, listen. And I always walk away with so much information that then gets funneled into program planning and staff meetings and, you know, even funding proposals. Yeah, we we do focus more around the parents, but the way we do that, it's it's pretty much the underserved area which about 37% of our families cannot meet the sustainability living wage that's needed. So it's a pretty high, believe it or not, in Silicon Valley. But um, a lot of it is doing it with staff that also are from the community. And about 50% of our participants are Hispanic, about 18% are Vietnamese. And we've had about, we're up to about 27,000 participants cumulatively. And I just say any of these classes could be taught anywhere uh, with dietitians and nutritionists. So um, we direct it more towards the parents learning to do it in the homes. We asked uh, what the number one factor is that limits people from choosing healthier food for one's health and one's family. And, and the number one factor was expense. The second uh, factor, which was um, related, is, um, is, is time time, right? Packaged foods are, are easy. You open them up and you consume them or you put them in the microwave uh, and, and that's it. Um, but expense, expense, expense seems to be the big, the big issue. Um, how, do we, how do we deal with that? Um, we have such disparity that it seems like, um, particularly people in the lower um, income levels, their access to fresh foods. Um, and I've seen it in we we had a um, we had a uh, discussion the other day in the San Joaquin Valley, which is you know breadbasket of 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 the United States, right? It's it's a huge agricultural area, and we have a uh, huge huge demand at food banks and food pantries because, uh, frankly, uh, access to those very products that are grown locally um, is is a real issue. The expense is a real issue. Um, is is part of the power of doing this through schools is the purchasing power and the economies of scale that reduces the expense of delivering uh, nutritious meals to children? Is that part of part of this? Absolutely. And again, uh, schools are really a great equalizer. Um, children are eligible for free and redu reduced price meals at school based on household income. <clears throat> and even for those children and families who pay for their meals, it's a very reasonable cost um, for the nutrition that the school meal provides. They must meet the regulations that are put forth by the United States Department of Agriculture. And as I shared earlier, out of all the meals that kids are eating, the healthiest meals are at school. So for those who qualify, they are free or reduced price. Um, they're readily available, they're nutritious, and they can help. If you know your child's getting fed breakfast and lunch at school, and many schools are now doing supper programs, um, that relieves the parent and, and the household uh, finances um, and gives you that sense of security. So schools just really play a significant role in nourishing youth and providing that safety net. You know, our second uh, poll was also interesting. We asked who should be, the pri who should be primarily responsible for educating youth on nutrition, and we had the, the, the top two answers um, resulting in about 75% of the response were parents and caretakers in schools and daycare facilities. What was interesting is that pediatricians made the list, so did community leaders. Government programs were not part of the education uh, piece. In other words, it was almost as if the entire group was saying, we got this as schools, we got this as as caretakers, yeah. we've got mm -hmm. this as as family, as nonprofits, government, not really a role in the education piece. Do you endorse that? Well, I don't. I don't. Because, <laughs> uh, you know, Anne Marie, uh, it's the greatest equalizer so that we have breakfast and lunch for all students. You know, you got to say it probably makes it a lot more efficient than trying to figure out which ones were on federal programs. And they found out that a lot of students that were eligible weren't signing up. They didn't want to be seen differently. So mm -hmm. if you can pass it through the whole state that every child gets breakfast and lunch, that's a real equalizer. And 
I agree. It, it makes it a healthier approach. I just think most people don't think of like schools or government, right? right. The I mean, school meals are federally funded. Yeah. yeah right. Right. Though, I mean, the national school lunch program is the most successful, you know, food security program of all time. Uh, you know, we're an organization that received SNAP Ed dollars, which is a USDA appropriation to focus on nutrition, education, and physical activity uh, among what I like to call underestimated students or underestimated communities. Um, and that has been wildly successful. I mean, we see across the board an increase in physical activity, an increase in vegetable consumption, uh, choice over water, over sugary drinks. Uh, and so our data certainly speaks to using, you know, federal funds, uh, a success certainly in achieving uh, some long-term nutrition and physical activity yeah, education. It's kind of like it's a support system, but those schools and families you know, 55 million kids in this country are in schools 180 days a year and, and their families are, you know, equally important. Um, and to your point, Kathleen, so many kids don't eat breakfast at school because they feel that it's a, there's a stigma associated with going to the cafeteria. Um, one of the areas of work that we're involved in is bringing that breakfast. We fund equipment to get the breakfast out of the cafeteria and more of a grab and go where kids can get it when they come right off the bus. So it reduces that stigma of eating in the cafeteria and reduces the hurdle of this morning bus schedule to get to the cafeteria. So there's multiple ways to you know go at it, but I think um, you know those federally funded school meal programs are a significant resource for children. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think we all work on probably we call it Cal Fresh in California. We have to name everything different, but <laughs> food stamps, um, you know, are a big issue for families and our. Uh, second harvest, which is like our food pantry, two thirds of the food they're giving out now is fresh fruits and vegetables. Um, so it's it's a tide changing. It's just not changing fast enough. And the kids, as you both say, are not getting the exercise they need too. Yeah, just one in four meets the recommended daily physical activity guidelines. You'd you'd both be interested, but there's a quite a few studies out right now that. The amount of time during the pandemic inside has affected vision. Hmm. So the amount of children be, being nearsighted has gone up significantly. Um, quite a bit of data out of China and the Economist. So, you know, it's not just that the exercise is important for your body, but it's your full body. It's your vision, yeah. too. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, it's interesting. And this is in response to some of the youth leadership impact, uh, input. We have we have d long done physical activity promotion for us in this moment. We are talking about physical activity as a coping or resiliency strategy oh, to good. combat for mental health days uh, and and just a very, you know, sort of heavy uh, and ongoing attention to poor mental health among not just Georgia students, but, you know, folks everywhere across the state. And so that has been a really interesting uh, sort of shift uh, in how in the narrative around our work. And that really came on the heels. There was a National Institutes of Health study that showed girls in particular that were active during the pandemic fared better in terms of their mental health and counterparts that were not as active. Mm. And we're seeing that every day. Uh, and one of our marquee programs is focused on getting middle school aged girls active because that's a time in which their physical activity really starts to drop off and then precipitates a lot of longer term health um, uh, impacts, negative impacts as a result. Uh, and I've got stories from parents that say things like, you know, she came down to the dinner table and for the first time she had purpose. She had something excited to talk about. Uh, and so I think while simple, good food, physical activity, moving your body, what we're tapping into is something that is on a much deeper level in terms of giving students agency and hope for their own yeah. futures. Confidence and connectedness. And yeah, exactly. Couldn't agree more. Yeah. Well, I'm going to be reaching out to both of you. So don't be yeah, surprised. Likewise. likewise. <laughs> we actually have grants opening um, in, in April for school nutrition programs. So if uh, listeners want to go to our website at genyouthnow.org, um, they're open to all public schools in the U.S. Right. You are also inspiring. I could be educated by you all day <laughs> and, and I might not be that much smarter at the end of the day, but I would be more informed. Thank you so much for sharing the work that you're doing. The thing that really strikes me is that if we all just paid attention to real essentials of American civil society, like our children, 
like nutrition, like uh, physical activity, we could actually advance this this country at a, at a much more rapid clip. We could take that energy where we have a, a huge amount of agreement and convert it into value for our kids. Anne-Marie Krautheim, CEO of GenU, Kathleen King, uh, CEO of Healthier Kids Foundation, and Jennifer Owens, President and CEO of Health and Powers. Thank you so much for sharing the work of your organizations with us. Thank, Please thank your staff. Thank, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Funders, your supporters, your clients, thank you so much. Thank your schools as well. Thank and, you. and thank you for the attendees. And there's a couple of items in the Q&A that look pretty interesting to read, too. So, Oh, yeah. Thank oh, you. yeah. Oh, we have great. We have a great audience. Thank you so much. Have Thanks. a great day. Thank you.